Hello everybody. Today we're going to talk about reproduction in plants. Do you know plants have a problem? Once they start flowering and they need to exchange their gametes, they cannot do so because they can't move. So how do they solve this problem? Lucky for them, nature has helpful friends. Pollinating agents like the bee can help in the process of fertilization. So welcome to BioWorld. I'm going to start the video off by outlining double fertilization. To do that, we need to understand the structure of the flower. Flowers are special. This is because they have both the male as well as the female reproductive structures within the same flower. The anther and the filament are both the male reproductive structures known as the stamen, while the stigma, the style, the ovary and the ovule are the female reproductive structures known as the pistil. However, self-fertilization will not occur because the development of the male gametes and the development of the female gametes do not occur at the same time. Let's start off with the production of the male gamete. This occurs in the anther. The anther has four pollen sacs. And in that pollen sac, there are many diploid pollen mother cells. One of the pollen mother cell will carry out meiosis to produce four haploid pollen grains. And in each one of the pollen grains, the nucleus will carry out mitosis to produce two nuclei. One smaller nucleus called the tube nucleus and a larger nucleus called the generative nucleus. The pollen grain then will secrete substances to coat the outer layer of the pollen and a mature pollen grain forms. The pollen sac will be full of these mature pollen grains and once the pollen sac burst open, the mature pollen grains will be free to carry out fertilization. Next, we look at the formation of the female gamete. This occurs at the ovule. The space in the ovule is called the embryo sac. Inside the embryo sac, there will be one embryo sac mother cell. This diploid cell will carry out meiosis to produce four haploid cells. But out of the four haploid cells, only one will survive. That one haploid cell will carry out mitosis three times. In this way, eight nucleus will be produced. The eight nucleus have a specific arrangement that is three on top called the antipodal cells, two nucleus will share the cytoplasm as one cell, so they are called the polar nuclei. Another two nucleus are called the synergic cells, and finally one at the bottom will be the ovum. You can notice that the polar nuclei and the ovum are colored differently to highlight the fact that these two cells are the ones involved in double fertilization. Now, once the embryo sac has eight of these nucleus, then the embryo sac is considered a mature embryo sac and ready for fertilization. Now, the plants that have flowered have produced both the mature pollen grain as well as the mature embryo sac. So the next step will be for the pollinating agent to collect 
the mature pollen grain and transport it to the flower to place it on the stigma. This is how cross-pollination occurs. Well done! The bee has successfully carried out pollination. Let's look at what happens at the stigma after this. Once the pollen grain touches the stigma, the pollen grain will begin to do pollen germination. This is when a pollen tube starts to grow. The stigma, in response, will secrete auxin, which will help to elongate the pollen tube. Now, the tube nucleus will help direct the growth of the pollen tube. While all this is happening, the generative nucleus will carry out mitosis to produce two haploid male gametes. Here you can see the pollen tube elongating all the way to the embryo sac. The two male gametes will follow behind. Let me magnify what is happening at the embryo sac. Here, the first ring is the embryo sac with the eight nucleus, and the second ring here is the ovule. Now you can see that at the embryo sac here, there is an opening called the micropyl. So the pollen tube will actually grow towards the micropyl. Once it has arrived at the micropyl, the tube nucleus will degenerate. And this will be a signal for the male gametes to travel into the embryo sac. Once inside the embryo sac, both the male gametes will carry out fertilization. So that's why the name double fertilization. But they fertilize two different cells. One of the haploid male gametes will fuse with the ovum to produce a diploid zygote. While the second haploid male gamete will fuse with the two haploid polar nuclei to form one triploid nucleus. The generative cells as well as the antipodal cells will degenerate. So at the end of double fertilization, the embryo sac will only have a diploid zygote and a triploid nucleus. So that sums up double fertilization. Let's move on to see what happens to the zygote and triploid nucleus. First, we have a look at what happens to the diploid zygote. The zygote will carry out mitosis to form two cells, the terminal cell and the basal cell. Both these cells will continue to do mitosis to form a multicellular structure. The terminal cells will form the pro-embryo, while the basal cells will produce the suspensor. Now, the suspensor's function is to hold the embryo to the wall of the embryo sac. It is the pro-embryo that will develop into the future plant. embryo will continue to do mitosis to become a larger structure. Here you can still see the suspensor present but above the suspensor onwards is the structure of the embryo. The bottommost structure here is the radical that is the future root and slightly above the radical we have the hypocotyl. 
This is the location for the cells that will become the root in the future. Then, further up, we have the epicotyl. Epicotyl is the location for the cells that will become the future leaf. And above the epicotyl, we have the plumule, which is the future leaf. Do not mistaken to think that these two tissues here are the plumule. These two tissues are the cotyledon. Cotyledon stores nutrient for use during seed germination. The triploid nucleus will also carry out mitosis and produce a multicellular endosperm. The function of the endosperm is to store nutrients for the developing embryo as well as for use during seed germination. Now the endosperm is visible in monocotyledon seeds like corn where you can see here there is the embryo with the plumule, the radicle and the cotyledon and above it you have the layer of endosperm. However, in a dicotyledon seed Endosperm is not visible because the nutrients that were stored in the endosperm have been transferred to the cotyledon. Embryonic development is followed with seed and fruit formation. Although this is the whole structure of the embryo, actually it's only between the radical to the plumule that will become the future plant. The balance of the embryo, that is the cotyledon, will be used to store nutrient, not only for the development of the embryo, but also for germination of seed. The embryo is inside the embryo sac. The space inside the embryo sac is occupied by the endosperm. And the endosperm can also store nutrient for the development of the embryo as well as seed germination. The embryo sac is inside the ovule. The space inside the ovule is called the nucellus, which also can provide nutrient to the developing embryo. The outermost layer of the ovule as well as the outermost layer of the embryo sac form what we call as the integument. During seed formation, the integument will harden and dry up to form the seed coat. So altogether, the structure of the ovule forms the seed. The ovule is inside the ovary. And the ovary will form the fruits. So you see the pink part here of the ovary is the flesh of the fruit that we eat. The next time you eat fruits, remember to thank little pollinating agents like the bee here who help transfer gametes from one plant to another to enable double fertilization. Until my next video, goodbye.